It's that time again. It's time to throw down in round two of Fright Night number two. Let's jump in. Welcome back, everyone, to Fright Night here on Random Thoughts. We're in our second event, and we're in round two of that event. And we've already seen a bunch of cool plays and a variety of strategies from all of our players. So we're going to jump in and see what round two has in store. Quick aside, everybody, before we get into the actual content, I was accepted into the Phobies Content Affiliate Program, the content creator program, you might call it. Shout out to the Phobies team and thank you for that. But the reason I'm telling you, everybody out there, dear viewer, dear listener, is to let everybody know that I do receive some compensation from the Phobies team as a result of being part of that program. Now, I loved Phobies before and I still love Phobies now and I expect I will still continue to love Phobies in the future. So look forward to more Phobies content coming from Random's Thoughts. So now, on with the show. Here we are zoning into game one between our blue player, Hall W, and our orange player, player himself. Shout out to the sucky avatar. Gotta, gotta show some love for the channel memes. But we're gonna jump into game one for round two of Fright Night number two and see what our players have in store. I'm gonna make an effort to try and commentate slightly differently than I have in the past. Get a little more focus on the mid-game and late-game plays. While I do stress the early-game plays, because you're always going to have a turn one <laughs> and you may not necessarily have a turn 9, 15, 20 kind of thing. But I do overemphasize, I think, the early plays a bit. In the meantime, aside putting that aside for the moment, we do have a little plants versus zombies action here. We got a little unicorn versus some Ted. I don't really like the early game resurrect phobies. The reason being is that your opponent's clearly still committing things to the board and they can will generally have some sort of early game in order to eliminate them. As we see here, there's actually a pretty quick invade to get that Ted right off the board. Now, clearly the cat's going to go down. We get a follow-up cowbell to try and leverage this 1-0 to panic point advantage for Blue. Now, the advantage here, given this particular setup, the unicorn opener, means that we're not getting... An enormous amount of board control right off the bat. We didn't get a flood of one keys like we see from the stabby opener to pressure the orange heart. This is a much more slow, a much or a much slower, a much more methodical kind of approach. But we're not seeing right here, or are we? We're getting some shots going down on bow mangles, which is a while well, speaking of stabby. I was going to say speaking of, or uh, reminiscent of the stabby opener, but we don't actually see traps go down we see softening up of bow mangles and then a retreat from the unicorn the retreat here is a little rough you kind of have to do it because exactly this so this cowbell while it if you just look at the existing phobies on the board the murder wing and the bow mangles they wouldn't be able to kill this unicorn with 600 health remaining if it remained in the spot by themselves because you'd have to sink in two attacks into the cowbell but Small map means that Jar can easily come out and snipe something as it does here, which would have allowed, you know, Jar plus two murder wing hits like we see here, eliminate Cowbell, advance from the bow mangles, and then blow up the, or you don't even need an advance, excuse me. If the unicorn stayed, then the bow mangles blows it up. This is why it had to get a retreat. So, from there... Let's see where our players take it. The Venus here, which has become a player's signature. Sorry, I got a quick coffee sip. It's early here as I'm recording, and it's hot. So the coffee isn't really a great choice, but got to stay high energy, right? So the Stabby's going to make its way down. The Venus, as I was starting to mention, is a player signature at this stage. The players have, many of the players, because we've grown in Fright Night number two from Fright Night number one, have developed these signature plays, signature phobies, where, like, that's their thing. And I love to see that, because that's really cool that players are kind of highlighting themselves and their particular strategies. And I think that's a lot of fun. And it's also cool storylines when we're talking about it. So we're starting to see the build-up here. Bow Mangles is able to actually retreat. Although there's a healing spot on this map, sometimes it can be a challenge, especially with these one-move phobies, to get it all the way out there. And we see the <laughs> we see the trap go down for our uh, unicorn over here, which is 
sure, why not? You got a spare action, you're going to be sitting on this anyway. So we're back to some Plants vs. Zombies action because we get a Ted from our blue player, which I can appreciate. Now, one thing I didn't call out because I was busy talking about the idea of the Venus, but not what it's doing. We can't see it on this replay, but there's likely a trap under this cat. If there wasn't before, there absolutely is now because it only moved one. Do we have... Yeah, it looks like it was used. That's why it's great out there. Now, we get a retreat here. This is possibly a vulnerable murder wing. It's possibly a vulnerable murder wing. But it's going to necessitate... Yeah, it's going to require that the stabby goes in. Now, something that I didn't mention a few turns ago is there was a position where the jar was down here, behind this panic point, below this obstacle. And it would have been able to cover where this murder wing was. The murder wing was up here in the north. It would The murder wing would not have been able to swing down. I don't believe there was anything else from our orange player that could have threatened the jar. But why does that matter? This murder wing... Oh, it has 840 health. I was going to say that the jar, if it was in that position, could soften up the murder wing. And then would only necessitate one attack from one of these. So you don't have to commit both. That being said, if that were to happen, that would mean the jar was sitting here. The murder wing would have invaded and sniped it because it wouldn't have just died immediately. I know I'm talking through a lot of hypotheticals for a board state that not only didn't exist, but also is from a few turns ago, if it were to exist. So I apologize if that's kind of confusing. Uh, but the point is that like trying to soften things up ahead of time, especially... You're trying to decrease the quantity of attacks so that way you can get in with a move, get an attack, kill something. Not get in, move something else in, then kill something like we saw here. Because now there are two phobies that are in range instead of one. Now, how much does that matter? I don't know. We'll have to see. But one thing that does matter is that this cat here is still alive. This cat survived at 97 health. And man, that it is excited to slap this stabby. It, it, look at that cat. That thing is excited. So, slappy cat here. The reason this matters, and it's going to seem like a weird thing to call out, but you assume when you're sending these one-key phobies in that they're just going to go in and they're going to die, right? They're not going to end up surviving and then they're going to get no further use. So you assume that their value is at a certain level. When they can survive and even get an extra hit, although this cat will probably just die from the reflective damage, like this cat is going to kill the stabby as a result. Chipping down these turret characters with stray hits from one keys or other damage just here and there is important because the whole point of the turret characters, stabbies, the bow mangles, the unbearables, is that they are the, these high HP units that can just sit on a point and they can't be dislodged. If you're able to get these stray hits where 363 damage is, you know, it's not huge. You're not talking about... I mean, Bo Mangles is doing over five. You're not talking about a Stairmaster hit or these other big things. But it's on a phobie that's going to die anyway. And it's from a phobie that... Well, I'm repeating the same point about it dying anyway. The second point, instead of repeating myself, is that you're getting this thing into range so that you can actually take it down in one fell swoop or much quicker than you wouldn't would otherwise instead of having to like okay i gotta build up this huge force so i can collapse on it with three different huge phobies you just chip it down into range and then all of a sudden it disappears i know it sounds like a lot about a single play but this cat surviving could be a turning point now it was because of the dive on the murder wing that's a more valuable phobie so getting rid of that Yes, relevant. But that means that all of these things are now in range, like we were talking about, as you can see these two getting hit. So we do, in fact, see the cat go down, but that means that the panic point stays orange, and this buys time for our orange player in order to get this erratic online. And what could our blue player have done there? Because this is starting to slide out of their control, I think. Uh, this is not an enviable position. You have two slow phobies. You have a jar, which while jar is very strong, is not really the answer to erratic. And clearly, Hevo can't just stand and fight these. So you need to supplement with something else. And that something else is a sheep. Now, I've talked many times about this. <laughs> this is actually funny because there was a trap there. I've talked about sheep before. I don't like sheep as an answer. I don't really like it on this map either. We'll see if the positioning, because this sheep must connect with that erratic. Full stop. Does it need to connect with anything else? Probably not, but like the sheep has to soften up the erratic. Our blue player does have a 6125 to 4100 health 
lead. So therefore, they have a little bit of time to just play it patiently and then try and get that sheep to sit in Erratic's lap and then explode. And then it'll explode itself. But anyway, I feel like this is starting to slip from our blue player's control. And we're going to put... But we are putting more pressure on the orange player by recapping this point. And the newly dead is going to necessitate something standing on it, but that's what the muffin's for, right? Muffin comes in, eliminates Ted. No more plants versus zombies. It's muffins versus zombies. Apparently, pastries are the arch enemy of the undead, I guess. I don't know. Uh, clearly, the muffin's not long for the world. It's just a matter of how it goes down. So we see a reposition here. How much health did this muffin have? This is a 600 health muffin. I feel like this positioning is not great. So we get a hit on Bow Mangles. Like, you didn't need to put two hits in this, I don't think. Did you? 616. No, like, one hit from the Jarm, one hit from the Hevo is sufficient. So the reason I'm calling that out is that the Jar... Where does the Jar end up? The Jar could have been down here, where the Sheep is, I guess. Because the... I think you want the Sheep to be where Hevo is. Or where Jinsting is. The reason I say that is you want it to mirror where the Erratic is so it minimizes the movement. So what could happen here is Erratic now advances to this choke point and you can't commit the sheep. The reason you can't commit the sheep is it's likely to die. I'm not counting it up, but I feel like the sheep just explodes if it goes in. We're closing in on the end of the game. We're on turn 18 of 24, so we're, we're going to get a decisive movement one way or the other. So at this point, we're again building up the armies. The Jar actually retreats to get a little bit of heal action going. I think it took some damage earlier from Stabby. Now, the sheep here go, does in fact go in, so we're about to find out. This means it's going to get hit twice by Bow Mangles, if Bow Mangles lives, which it doesn't. Oh no, it had to require the Jin Sting commit as well. So, Bow Mangles goes down, but we're going to get two erratic hits, a Jar hit, possibly a Jin Sting hit. This is a 1600 health Oh, wow, this is a pretty high-level erratic. This is a level 9 erratic, so it's doing almost 500 a clip. It's a 1,600 health sheep, so let's see if it can tank this. Once again, not counting it up. More fun this way. All right, it's under... Like, I don't see this surviving, because, like I said, almost 500, so we say 1,000, meaning it has, like, 600 and change left. That's a dead sheep, and that's probably an L for our blue player, because I you can't fight what they have with what you have remaining. You see the Jinsting valiantly standing its ground. But then we get, unfortunately, the Hevo invade because, you know, you had to. Oh no, and the trap to add insult to injury. The trap to add insult to injury. So yeah, I, I feel like the sheep positioning was problematic. Again, I'm not a huge fan of sheep anyway. There were eight keys remaining for our blue player at that stage. Could they have done something differently? Possibly. I'm not sure. But obviously this one didn't work out in their favor. The erratic here was able to assume a pretty, a pretty safe position standing in between those obstacles and just kind of took over the game at that point. Which, you know, erratic does. But GG, we're going to take a look at game two between these players. See if they can make it to three, or does the game get closed out in two? We'll find out. Here we are zoning into game two between our blue player, Paul W., and our orange player, rocking the sucky avatar, it's player himself. A player is up one game to zero in this best of three series. So, we'll have to see if they're able to close this game out, or is Hall W. able to score a victory and bring it to game three? Now, as mentioned in the last game, we're going to deflect a little bit from the opener. We'll see if either player does anything that makes me break that idea. Now, we do get a Grave Digger break, speaking of breaks, and Newly Dead. I know we're not talking too much about the openers, but a little bit. The Murder Wing here allows for an easy cap up in the north, as we're seeing now. 
you're not going to get the invade because it's just too dangerous. And the jar follow-up here means that you can help soften up any advance from the orange player. But what are they going to do on their turn two? I get the sense that we're going to see a Venus. How did I know that? Probably because we've watched a few player games before. <laughs> and Venus is, as mentioned in the previous game, somewhat of a signature. On this map, I don't know. I've seen some trap phobies, but we... Okay, we get a cool play on the third blue player's turn. That is, we get an aggressive invade from this murder wing. Now, is this worth it? The meatball actually goes down on the Gravedigger, which is pretty cool. You could be incinerating three keys from your opponent. Let's see, where does that... So the jar is... <laughs> the jar is landing on this Gravedigger, which does survive despite how dangerous this looks. Now, the problem is... Is this a dead murder wing? There's 484 damage from this Gravedigger. The newly dead and the Venus cannot reach the murder wing, which may have been what triggered this in... Hollow W's or Hall W's mind that you can't threaten my murder wing with anything on the board other than the gravedigger. So what are you going to supplement it with? Well, it could be a jar. A jar, unless a player has like, and we saw the jar last game. I don't remember what level it was, but it wasn't like a pocket level 17 jar or something. So it's not going to be pushing enough damage with solely the gravedigger in order to kill this murder wing. You're not going to get it with a drony because that's the only other three move thing that's likely at this point in time other than a snowball now a snowball could spell doom for this murder wing we didn't see it last game i don't know if player has that in their collection but a decently leveled snowball could put out like 400 damage and then the combination between the snowball its burn and the hit from the gravedigger probably is a dead murder wing but we'll see if that actually materializes in the meantime, we have the cat sneaking out in order to cover this bottom point so that that way, if Ted invades, we can kind of soften it up or re back claim points depending on how our orange player reacts. But our orange player actually retreats. Our orange player retreats. Now, I'm not a huge fan of this. Let's see what they follow up with. Okay, so it's a jar. You could make the argument that this is to body block for the jar, but remember, the meatball's on cooldown. So even if the... the Murder Wing were to fly over to where this Venus is and try and hit the jar, it's not going to kill it. This is, by the way, a... Whoop. This is, by the way, a level 8 jar. So, yes, 266 damage would not have been able to kill that Murder Wing with the... Uh, with the Grave Digger. You kind of need two things to threaten this Murder Wing. You kind of need two things. Why do you need two things? Well, if you just send the grave digger and the jar let's say it could pop over kill the grave digger and then i guess trade because then the jar would have gotten like it's going to get a hit here then it gets two more hits and then maybe there's something to supplement it i don't know like the ted is not going to do anything maybe it's just there to help you know pressure the murder wing to guarantee like hey this stuff is all here if you stay you're dead but again if the murder wing pulls back here and pops the grave digger it would just be the jar anyway because the ted can't get to it similarly the venus I'm, i don't really like the venus coming back the venus was here i believe where was the venus start okay so the venus was here to start this turn i don't really like the venus here moving back it doesn't need the body block for the jar, because again, Meatball is on cooldown. You're not going to, like, even if this flies in, it's a 295 damage, so, like, it's it's not as though an invasion from Murder Wing and Jar gets the jar or, you know, multiple things. That's not going to happen. So you don't need to body block. And I guess it's, again, needed to just chew the Murder Wing away. I don't know. This seems... I was going to say an overextension, but you're playing defensively, so an underextension? I don't know. In pulling all of this back, something needs to be forward. You've ceded control of, like, the entire board, just about, and you're not going to get anything out of this. So it's a big tempo swing. But let's see how this goes down. We get the free shot onto Ted. 
And we get the retreat from the jar onto the stem. I don't even know that it needed to go back that far. And we get a Hevo follow-up. So now our orange player has to find a way to re-advance their offense. And instead, they're not really advancing their offense. They're uh, reconfiguring their defense and supplementing it with a murder wing. Now, they're up to five phobies, so they've locked themselves out of any reinforcements at this stage, and they have three keys banked. But this is the danger. This is the danger. So, appropriately and correctly, LW notices that, hey, I can just aggressively invade. I had, They had softened up. Let me re rewind this. So, this Gravedigger, at the start of the turn, is at a mere 200 health. So, that means that you can get in, snipe the jar, not even with a meatball, I think they just do it with a basic attack because you get plus 340 damage. Yeah, they're going to snipe it with a base attack. That's going to heal this to full health, which means that it's going to tank a bunch of these hits. The jar can then eliminate the Gravedigger. And oh, by the way, we're on the last turn. And honestly, yeah, if I was in player's shoes, I'd probably scoop it up here because that is just... That's a brutal turn. Like, that is painful. Look at this. Oh, and by the way, Ted dies too. That's a beautiful turn from Hall W. Shout out, because that... The setup, that was several turns in the making. That was a cool sequence of plays to pressure your opponent, get them uncomfortable, force them into a position they don't want to be in, and then punish them for being in a position they didn't want to go into to begin with. So shout out to Hall W. But let's take a look at Game 3 between this series of Hall W and Player himself. So we had somewhat of a long game on Home Sweet Home. Then we had a lightning fast game on Ergo. Now we're zoning into Raining Worms, or better known as Rent Pass Due. Once again, with our blue tr blue player, player himself, spawning up here in the top left, and our orange player, Hall W, spawning in the orange trunks down here in the bottom right. We get a Creep and Gesundheit opener, which I know I said I was going to avoid talking about the openers, but this one's unique. Going first, I could see going 2-2 with a variety of different things, but Creep and Gesundheit is kind of unique because you don't typically, like, the Gesundheit's slow, but the Creep I really like, and this is worth talking about because this is the standard opener on this map, is Murder Wing from both players, and then some sort of, uh, you know, supplementary phobie in order to cap the other points, give more map control. Why does this matter? Because we've talked about this on... A variety of streams and other game breakdowns creep is less a stabby assassin and more a murder wing assassin the creep allows you to get a poison onto murder wing yes the creep will probably die but if it poisons the murder wing the murder wing is almost definitely dead you, or in this case it's probably if it gets poisoned it's gonna have to run away maybe like get a shot to heal a little bit and then run away and then try and wait out the poison, then maybe get a meatball later before it dies. But it puts a lot of pressure on the Murder Wing player. So, I think this is a cool adaptation to the expected opener of Murder Wing. I'm not real sold on the Gesundheit here, but the problem is, is, you know, you need another two key. If you don't have Maggie, you can't take this point. You know, there are some limitations, collection-wise, we'll say. Assuming that's the case. Maybe player chose to do this, and we'll have to see if Gesundheit really matters. But the Gesundheit is able to set up the 2-1 to one panic point advantage off the bat. This could have been a 3-1 to one at this point, if it was a murder wing. But we actually see, of course, Venus, and we get a... Fi is this Finnegan or is this Slammerhead? This is Finnegan, right? This is Finnegan. I always confuse the two. But we get a Finnegan. Land shark, baby. So the murder wing is going to have to retreat. It normally would try and go for this bottom left panic point, but for all the reasons we elucidated earlier, it can't. And we get a klepto follow-up due to the bank. Now there's one key still remaining and gets held for next turn for our orange player, and we get the cat swinging up to try and claim this point. Now the Gesundheit is now in position. The cat will die if it goes up there, and you're not... This is another cool part of this opener, as we see a Hevo about to come down. We'll see which kind of Hevo. The reason this is a cool opener is it's less keys tied up. There, this dance that happens up here in the top right and in the bottom left on this map often revolves around a low-key unit from the player that starts on that side and then a murder wing or something similar. Here, you're, it's one less key that gets tied up as well as murder wing is still going to be available for our blue player that could be running around the map if they choose to spawn it. 
this only quote unquote locks this Gesundheit into position here. And that way you don't have to worry about expending more valuable units to hold this point. So that's why I wanted to call out to the earlier point when I was saying it seems a little weird that Gesundheit came out, but we can kind of see the fruits of that particular strategy manifesting now. So we do get a regular Hevo 1.0. I wasn't sure exactly how many keys player had available at that point. And the Panic Point Advantage stays blue. It's only 2 to 1. This is a big map that's not a lot of pressure. There's still plenty of time for lots of things to happen on both sides of the board. So we now get a Jar follow-up. The Jar is interesting. I do... like We could all respect the power of Jar, but... Is that really what you need here? I guess it's fine. A lot of Orange's forces are getting tied up up here. Now, the difference is, is it does... The Jar supplement allows for, say, Murderwing and Jar to pop the Gesundheit, which is why it retreated here. So maybe pushing it away in that fashion is sufficient. But you're still going to have to keep... Swing the cat back in. I guess that's fine. In the meantime, we see the Venus start doing Venus things. And we are going to get Jar trading for the Gesundheit. This one... I don't know about this one. I don't know about this one. The reason I say this is this jar is going to be dead, right? We're going to get some violence about to happen here. And it's just a question of which things are going to go down. Likely this jar is dead. Meatball is going to be on cooldown. So you're not going to get as much damage out of the, the murder wing. But if something goes in for the jar, you're kind of walking into the teeth of Hall W's forces. So maybe this is okay. And notably, Creep does have Spit online, so it could Spit on, presumably, Klepto or Stabby. In the meantime, we're getting an Orange Hevo follow-up. And the Panic Points are even at this stage, so it's going to be a fight over this now trapped-up Panic Point in the center. <laughs> I was wondering how this would work. We talked about this at length last night, that I am still, to this day confused as to how the boops will work but this one isn't really like this one was fairly obvious i just didn't quite notice the klepto immediately and seemingly neither did hall w so there's only two valid locations for the jar to get booped back to one of which is the abyss tile and the other is where klepto is standing so guess what sayonara jar Bye bye so the jar goes down that's a nice pickoff because even if this Finnegan goes down, it is key positive. So we don't need to get the Invade from the Creep. We instead get the Cowbell going in and a reposition from Venus as well as the Hevo in order to allow the Spider. This is... It kind of necessitates either an Invade from Hall W or you have to retreat completely. I think a half and half approach here would spell Doom. But we're going to see the Klepto get some good splash going down. Softens up the uh, Hevo here. We'll get an elimination on the Finnegan, obviously. It, it was not long for the world. So technically, we traded key even. It was the jar for Finnegan and Cowbell because the panic point is now going orange. And we get the follow-up here. So I guess it, at the end, this was kind of a half and half. It wasn't really an invade. It wasn't really a retreat. Well, there obviously was no retreat. But we actually don't see the panic point go orange because, by the way, remember that hit from Gesundheit earlier on the cat? The trap means that it doesn't reclaim the point, which is significant because now our orange player has to recommit something and there's no body block. So we're going to see some, some brutal beats go down onto this Hevo. In fact, enough to be lethal. That's a dead Hevo. Oof. Big oof. Now, honestly, I'm trying to think. It Would it have been reason... You have to assume that there's a trap here, right? We're going to let it play because there's enough time for me to explain this. You have to assume there's a trap here. That Venus has been on the board way too long for there to not be a trap somewhere, right? Now, it's possible that there is not a trap there and it's instead surrounding this panic point. However... Given the panic point situation where it was even for so long, or slightly in blue player's advantage, I think it's safe to assume that there's a trap here, which means that if you invade, and the order of operations is something that you will only learn if it's happened to you. 
I don't think there's any way to know this ahead of time. I don't think Lippy tells you in the tutorial. So you need to keep this in mind. Similarly, things like healing spa order of operation. So if you're poisoned, you will heal on the healing spa first before the poison goes off. That sort of thing. If there's fire there, you will heal before the fire, so you'll tank through it. That sort of thing. And believe me, I constantly screw this up, so if people are missing that, you're not alone. I don't want to say you're in good company because, you know, you're with me, but you get the idea. <laughs> Regardless, we're now getting even more good splashes from Klepto. I don't know that this is a dead spider. I assume it is. Yeah, you wouldn't have beezed. Beezed? You wouldn't have used bees in that way if you weren't going to do it. So we do see the meatball go down. We see a follow-up primate, which is pretty cool. You see a follow-up primate, and then an eternal knight. There are ten keys remaining for both players, five in the bank for each at the moment. And we're going to see a dead murder wing at the very least. The question is, what else is going to stay in position? We do have another trap on the center point, though so I assume that eternal knight's going to go in and try and claim it. Uh-oh, are we losing the... No, oh no. We The Hevo is softened up due to a variety of splash effects, but it's still alive. The Jin Sting is still fairly healthy. We have a very healthy Stairmaster. This is not looking great for our orange player. We actually see the Primate going in, which is a little surprising. Presumably this is just to get enough damage in order to try and kill the Hevo. Which, in fact, yes, it is, because otherwise the Eternal Knight could not reach. So it's going to reposition. The Eternal Knight does represent a lot of damage, and we actually get Wooly Bully to supplement the Orange Forces. Now, that trap means that, yes, this Primate is probably dead. If you're in a game and multiple traps activate, it's very difficult to come back. We have seen and reviewed some games where that is not the case, where, in fact, you are able to tank through the traps, in that particular case, it was a lot of freeze traps, so that's a little different than if your phobies are just straight up dying as a result. So the primate goes down. We're going to see a dead stabby due to the cat, which means the cat not only lives, but even if it died, who cares? All of your important stuff is still alive. And we have three keys remaining thanks to a supplement from Murderwing for our blue player. Now, the panic point advantage is going orange, and this klepto is still pushing a ton of splash. And we get a power down on Venus. Unfortunately, due to all of the deaths on our orange player's side, there's just not enough damage to supplement anything here. So the power down on Venus presumably is just because otherwise it's going to be able to invade and then the, in conjunction with other things, either cause an elimination. Let's see. How's the health on this? Things are pretty healthy. Maybe, I don't know. I mean, I understand not wanting to take the damage, but maybe it would have been worth doing the power down or holding the power, hold, doing it on something else or holding it. I don't know. But we get a Clinico follow-up and then Unicorn to chew through the remaining keys for our orange player. I'm not sold on either of those. The Unicorn is very slow, obviously. Uh, it might just be the highest damage two key remaining for our orange player, which I can understand. Um, maybe two one keys would have been better, because in combination they produce more damage. The Clinico is okay, uh, but I'm just not a fan of Clinico unless you absolutely need it, for a few different reasons. I can understand because Creep is still on the board, but unfortunately it looks like this Unicorn is just going to go down right away. We get a little splash from our blue player, thanks to bees. We get the elimination there. And I don't think there's enough damage. Actually, this is 1,200. So this could be a very dead gin sting, but that would require hanging out here, which is in range of this Stairmaster, which is very scary. Stairmaster can absolutely pump out a ton of damage, and everything from our, or, or, excuse me, our blue player is... Posi oh, no. Eternal Knight goes down. Body blocking the Wooly Bully. So while we do get the kill there, you can only take a shot here and walk away. Oof. Ouch. We actually get a body block from Clinico, which I think is a, a solid play here from our orange player, but honestly, the writing's kind of on the wall, as you can tell from the turn counter down at the bottom, and I think we're going to see the victory going towards player himself. The, uh, 
the spare trap just in case and while klepto is pretty powerful i don't think that that's going to be sufficient to fight through all of the forces here from the blue player this is pretty well played this whole series by both players we saw some awesome plays from hall w especially in game two we saw some cool plays also from player himself and setting up a variety of these scenarios and of course you gotta love the venus you don't see Venus from a lot of players, and like I said earlier, I appreciate when these players are developing their in-game personalities, so to speak, getting their signature trademarks with certain phobies, which is pretty cool. As we move into the final turn of this game, we get the takedown on Wooly Bully, and just like that, the series is over. GG. Well, that's going to do it for this particular breakdown. We have plenty more round two games coming at you, and then round three, hopefully after that. Fright Night will probably be coming to an end in the near future, so if you're interested in playing in Fright Night number three, head on over to the Random Slots Discord. It'll be in the, the links and description for this video, or come by the live stream RTChompGG over on Twitch. But as always, everybody, thank you for listening, thank you for watching, and Black Lives Matter.